Good afternoon to all the attendees from India and overseas, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, B Singular is a unique learning platform that empowers the next generation to create real and responsible impact in the world by working with the technologies of the future. We teach exponential technologies uh, to make our next gen better place to solve global great challenges. We also have a B Singular Exponential Leaders Club, which is a by invitation club only, comprising of a community of young dreamers who wish to work together and help change the world. We conduct our courses in digital mode, so it's physical and digital. You can go to bsingular.com and check out on the Exponential Technologies courses which we run. Uh, B Singular Social, which is backing these webinars, is a non profit entity that has been launched by B Singular in collaboration with the Bannon, a leading child daycare center chain. Our objective at B Singular Social is to invest our resources to help foster exceptional educational experiences and learning for the families. I have a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Spencer Casimir. Alumnus of, alumnus of Howard Business School and bachelor's and master's from University of Southern, Southern California with, uh, with specialization in sports and fitness. Uh, Spencer is a chief representative of Austral Asia for Sports Beam Lighting Incorporated. In this long one hour session, Spencer will share insights into the future of professional sports industry, looking at past standards, current mores, and discussions with experts into both the in home and ARENA interactive virtual reality markets. Presenting to you all from B Singular Social, Spencer Casimir. I thank you so much for having me and putting everything together for all of our colleagues to come together and present on just such so many interesting things that are going on in the world today and opportunities where we can share with the next generation, our own generation, hopefully future generations. Um, so thank you. This is really a special experience and what you're doing is phenomenal. Thank uh, you. What we're looking at today is the future of professional sports. And this really covers a few areas. It's not just your traditional sports. It's not just your virtual reality. It's not just your esports. It's actually changed, as people quite imagine, in the last few weeks to something that's completely different and something, something unique. Um, but it's not entirely uh, exclusively limited to COVID-19. Um, before we talk about the present and the future of professional sports, we should probably understand where professional sports come from. Uh, how it really started, and giving a basic platform of understanding of how we define professional sports today based on the events of yesteryear. Um, most modern sports come from England, uh, from the public school system, as we would say, uh, the private school system uh, outside of England. And if you look at the, and these are for football codes, you have cricket, Obviously, our earliest records of the sport are from the 1700s, um, and it was a gentleman's game played by um, people who had the time to play sports, to enjoy sports, and did not have to worry about getting to the mines or uh, digging eventually during the Industrial Revolution. Um, one of the most common questions I get asked is, well, what does it mean to be professional? Um, most people outside of Australia and um, mostly off the N62 in England are unfamiliar with the differences between, for example, rugby union and rugby league. And professionalization was being defined in the 1880s um, as to, is it okay to pay somebody? Now, to, nowadays, the conversation around professionalism is that athletes get paid so much, though I would argue that the amount most athletes get paid during their average career is not enough to actually survive off of a lifetime. However, at the time, the concept of getting paid anything to play sports was considered abhorrent, uh, honestly, because it kept people who were not from your same socioeconomic group from competing against you. Obviously, rugby league split from rugby union because they wanted to pay people who missed a little bit of time from work so that they could play sport as well. Baseball actually heavily in uh, influenced uh, soccer, uh, association football, 
uh, when in 1885, uh, soccer in England decided to adopt full professionalism based on the National League Baseball model. That's why both groups have no salary cap even today. Um, and other things occurred along the way that helped shape what we do today. However, what this all amounts to is a shift in paradigm from sport as a form of entertainment for the participant to sport as a form of entertainment for the viewer. We see changes in cricket in the late 1880s. In 1889, the number of balls in an over moves from four to five. They decide to decimalize. That was actually the original reason. And when they saw that there was a greater flow of the game for the bowler, who usually was not considered to be not unimportant, but not the position played by the aristocracy, then it became six in 1900. Now, of course, in Australia, in uh, India for a few years, and in many other countries, eight overs were the standard for some time. But we obviously settled on six. Why? Because most of the world was doing it that way, and the form of ed entertainment that we enjoyed allowed for there to be a certain amount of frequency of switching between the sides with the bowlers. So what exactly are we looking at um, in terms of the, uh, the future of professional sport? Um, the question I get asked most probably is to do with COVID-19 today, as you can imagine. Where's the money going to come from? We're not having people in stands. We're not having any sports on for the most part at the moment. But even pre-COVID-19, things were different. Some sports thrive off of a model where people show up. We all love a good fan base. We all love a good crowd. It's an enjoyable experience. But certain sports were, have always been more towards television uh, since probably starting in the 70s um, and onwards, so maybe arguably late 60s um, in certain markets. But the way in which broadcasting brought professional sport to people is even different for each different sport. For example, in the NFL, contracts are national. There's only 16 uh, games in the season. And there's enough games where you can actually stratify them throughout the week that these, cons uh, that these uh, matches get um, paid out on a national contract scale. Whereas a sport like baseball that has so many games in a season actually does a lot of local contracts with local networks, local TV stations. So it's highly decentralized in that aspect. Um, and what does this have to do going forward? Well, the question now is, is that a sustainable model? Are either of these? Do we need more homogenization? Do we need it to be more uh, centered around these national contracts? And there is no right answer. And I don't think it's an appropriate model for every sport because sometimes there are way too many teams with way too many games to provide an opportunity where we can actually create a financially viable model. Uh, the second most pre-COVID-19 question that I was asked is, what about up and coming sports and up and coming divisions within sports? Um, different styles of playing the game uh, and whatnot. What is going to happen and to the growth pattern uh, of these sports? And it's actually quite interesting because there have been opportunities that people have shown interest in other versions. I think the most popular adapted version of a sport that's come to market is probably 2020 cricket. It's, uh, you know, don't hate me too much and don't blame my accent. But the 2020 model uh, isn't just an extension of one day cricket, but it's also uh, based loosely around the number of pitches in a professional baseball game, which is 146 or so. It provides an opportunity that people can go after work specifically, enjoy a match and go home. We have to remember that test cricket, uh, going back to the original uh, statement I made about the history of the sport and how we have the oldest code from it in 1750s or so, give or take. Well, this was being played to entertain people. They didn't really think about what it would be like to entertain people watching. It was never really meant to be that way. It's the way it became. So when 2020 was brought about around 20 years ago in terms of popularizing it, it was a huge opportunity where people now didn't have to miss work. Test matches are playing during the daytime. Well, you're working, you miss it. 
um, probably the next biggest within the cricket world, at least. And I think it's a very meaningful one is a few years ago with the shift to a day night test test match, which started in Adelaide. Um, some people aren't a fan of the pink ball uh, or the pink ball format for your uh, day night test matches. But I think we could all acknowledge that the numbers have consistently shown that the viewership is much higher than your standard test match because people have it much more accessible to them in the times where they're not working. Um, there is a lack of alignment in sports culture and the greatest efficiencies sometimes in terms of getting the most people engaged and involved. Um, but for the creator's vision of how the sport really should take place, we really would not have that. Um, now, we were talking about broadcast for a bit. And that brings up a really, really interesting question. Well, sports are not happening right now. What are we going to do to get them restarted? Now, there's no right answer because every league has its own constraints. And one of the key areas of constraints that, frankly, is a bit difficult is um, travel. Now, if you placed everybody in one location and everybody was on a proverbial lockdown, literal or physical, or however you want to interpret it, or however you want to define what a lockdown is, um, it's a bit difficult to say how you would travel with it. Um, not just in terms of international, but certain domestic competitions as well. If you look at the Australian system, we have a bunch of states and a few territories. But each one of those has different policy now that COVID-19 is struck. When you cross state lines, the policies are different. So in the states of Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland, um, Tasmania, for example, you have 14 days of self-isolation. And that's not from coming into the country. That's from crossing from one Australian state to another Australian state. Now, the states of New South Wales and Victoria, which have respectively the capitals of Sydney and Melbourne, don't have this policy. So it really is a matter of each state doing that. Now, if you compare the two competitions over here of football codes, there's Australian rules football, which is not rugby. It's still an oval ball, uh, but a very different sport. Uh, a lot of kicking. It's played on a cricket pitch. But eight out of the 18 teams are in other states, though 10 of them are in Victoria. Um, and that does create a problem because a lot of these states have that 14 day lockdown and it makes it logistically difficult to do that uh, sort of thing. Uh, the other competition, uh, Rugby League, the NRL, um, has the, the dominant amount of teams in New South Wales which is fine because like the AFL, most of the teams are in Victoria. Both of these do not have a 14 day uh, self-isolation period, but they only have five other teams outside of the area. It doesn't seem like that much of a difference, but New Zealand's team that plays in Auckland had agreed already to stay in Australia post COVID to promote the competition to go forward. And that set a bit of a standard to say, well, if the team that is across the Tasman, uh, three hours flight away in another country is willing to stay here, the other four teams, three in Queensland and one in Victoria, better feel a little bit like, well, if they're willing to stay internationally, we should uh, maybe contribute to that as well. Now, what does this have to do with the global market then? Um, well, it becomes much more difficult, but let's put a pin in that for right now um, because that will come down the line. If we're looking again at how these competitions are structured, there are there is, a, to be fair, um, two other football codes. One is soccer that's played here, uh, which has many teams across many states, and rugby union. But what's interesting to note about rugby union, this is a different sport, is their structure that their club teams actually participate in a competition with club teams from New Zealand, South Africa, Japan, and Argentina. Now, that provides huge obstacles, massive ones, because now you're not only dealing with state borders, you're dealing with international borders, and you're dealing with international broadcast rights deals. It's very, very complicated in that sense um, on how we're going to proceed in these various markets, because 
the whole beauty behind what's known as super rugby uh, was that you had club teams from all of these countries. And it was somewhat of a mixture between our internationals, our test matches, which it's not because they're club teams, um, but it was still on an international scale. And we're not talking about uh, something like the NHL, which has always had teams in both Canada and the US. Um, now, what we have to look at today, post COVID-19, is what is going on around the world with competitions that are continuing? Not just the ones that have uh, stopped entirely, but the ones that are still going forward. Now, the country of Belarus has come up a few times. Um, they're proceeding, you know, business as usual. Soccer is going on and continuing, and that's that. But for a lot of people in the international communities, um, that's not cutting it for them. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think it's fair to say, just on basic assessment, that most people don't really know how we should approach COVID-19 in a responsible way. Everybody has opinions. Most people say letting it go unrestricted is not the path we want to take. Um, so we have to look at this because right now all of the leagues and competitions I had mentioned previously had fully canceled. They had one round, maybe five rounds or a few rounds, uh, depending on when their season started, but they're all done now. So how do we proceed in a way that's responsible, um, but also allows for the competition to continue. And what are the ramifications? What are the new hurdles of getting the ball rolling again? We always talk about momentum and it's the most amount of petrol that's wasted on a tank of gas is um, when you're in your car and then you have to stop and start again. That's the most energy. We've come to a grinding halt right now. We're trying to pivot that energy and use that momentum to go somewhere, but the longer it stays stagnant, the harder it is to stop. Uh, so sorry, the harder it is to start again and get that momentum back. Um, I'd like to take a look at what Japan has done in two cases that are quite different though, even though they're both in Japan. The first case is the Olympics. We're all pretty much familiar with that. The Olympics have been delayed by a whole year now. Um, we don't know uh, if that's gonna stay a permanent date, my guesstimate, it probably will. Um, just based on things that have happened within the last 48 hours in the sporting world, I think it's likely that it will go on. Will some teams not show up? That's a possibility, uh, but I do think the competition will continue. Um, but let's come back to the Olympics and look at the other case and then compare and contrast the two approaches that these two groups within Japan have taken. And many of the people listening probably have not watched this sport. Uh, I became personally uh, attached to it while I was living in Japan and uh, speaking Japanese and doing business there. I do watch the sumo wrestling. So um, sumo wrestling is a competition where for six of the 12 months, so every other month, all year round, there is a 15 day competition. So January, March, May, so on and so forth. And for those 15 days, we have competitions. Now, the January Basho, as it's called, um, this is pre-COVID, went on, crowd, attendance, everything was fine. However, the March Basho had COVID to deal with. And what happened in that situation was quite fascinating. Now, most people that I speak with that have a limited knowledge of Japan will still know and think of Japan as an extremely hygienic, clean place. And because of that, they respect and understand a lot about the culture, even from a very superficial point of view. You know, you go to Tokyo, Osaka, and many of these places, and the culture just promotes this very tidiness to it um, compared to what most of us are used to. Um, I mean, a friend of mine, when I went over there the first time, when I was just a teenager, said, oh my goodness, I could eat off the floor um, just in the middle of the street. But Sumo, Sumo went through with their competition in March. No stopping. The only thing that changed was that the audience was removed, live audience specifically, of course, they did broadcast, and some of the rituals were amended 
So you no longer had the shared ladle to sip on the water and spit out the water and do the whole procession. You would emulate taking the water. You would not actually do that. And you had your temperature te tested as a wrestler and every member that would be inside the area before entering. So one wrestler did come in with a fever. It was only, I think, one, half a degree too high, uh, but he was sent home both of those days. Uh, wrestlers are no longer allowed to use um, public transportation. There were other things put in place and the competition not only continued, it went through the whole 15 days. There is a delay for the May competition, but it's not what you'd assume it is. It's only a two week delay. Structuring, organization, things to allow them to prepare even better. So how do we get these two contrasting situations in one country? And I think the answer is pretty blatant. You can't have an Olympics unless you have teams from international countries. It doesn't work. It's, it's out of the, the um, IOC, the Inter International uh, Olympic Committee's control as to which teams decide to show up and not. Many of these teams from many of these countries have already pulled out and that money is being allocated for other purposes in the interim. This is a very bad thing for um, athletes that may lose a chance at 2021. Certain countries may or may not keep the rostered athlete uh, that they currently have. Um, so, again, I can't speak for athletes. Many of them are very happy about the delay of the uh, Olympics for, you know, COVID-19 fears. But it would be remiss to say that some of them aren't worried that they may lose out on their spot and their chance of a lifetime to compete in an Olympics. So the Olympics had to be delayed. It's out of the central control. It's out of Japan's control. It's not attainable. Sumo, on the other hand, is highly insular. It is one group of guys that come from a massive set of rankings all the way to the top of Yokozuna, um, which there are two right now, and they do compete in one ring. The difference is they only shift between Tokyo and a few other cities um, throughout the year in going back and forth in these competitions. So you have Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, um, uh, and what this does is it creates a sort of centralized ability to reduce your moving pieces, reducing your variables, reducing the chances of outbreak. We're talking about a sport where guys are wearing a mawashi, the, uh, the loincloth, if you would, and nothing else. And there's full body-to-body -body contact. So they're taking a very proactive approach while keeping the ship afloat and keeping it sailing. Um, obviously, there's a big hit in terms of where we actually look towards in terms of how we're going to proceed best with getting our competitions together. If you look at sports like cricket, you look at uh, your football codes, whether they're the tackle ones or not tackle codes, um, we need to be looking at the best practices. And unfortunately, there's not that much data as people would expect in terms of the risks involved. Now, uh, from a legal perspective, I'm also not a lawyer, but there is something called primary assumption of risk, and then there's secondary assumption of risk. And both of these are absolute keystones to how successful we will be going forward, how we address both of these. A primary assumption of risk, kids, is when you are playing a sport. If you're playing cricket or baseball or anything else where there's a tackle, for example, you're accepting that there's a risk to play the sport. You may get hit in the head, hopefully not the neck, but something bad could happen from that ball popping up and hitting you. And if you get tackled, you can land the wrong way and get injured. Now, that primary assumption of risk means that we understand that by playing the game, it's not the same as everyday life. Nobody throws a ball at you, at your head, and you're not holding a bat when you walk around in everyday life, unless you really, really love to play cricket. <laughs> um, but that's not just limited to the risks of playing now. There's also the increased perceived risks um, of potentially other airborne diseases. What is the risk if everybody in the competition comes down with something similar to COVID-19? Um, well, we don't know that. That can uh, actually heavily impact things such as insurance 
and other policies that allow our sports to take place. Um, and that same part, well, what happens if everyone on the team gets sick? What happens when we bring everybody back or allow everybody back to watch in the stands? Um, I have a few polls going on, and I was curious to know how, may, how quickly would you be willing to come back and watch a game live in the stands once we are allowed to come back? Um, what would you do? Would you come, as soon as governments allow people to congregate again and go to professional games, would you come back immediately once it's legal and it's allowed? Would you wait a few months? Would you never go back at all? It's a real question that we have to answer because that does impact how we choose to continue to go on with sports. It's not a very easy thing to answer for some people and other people. It's quite obvious. Now, again, people are going to answer this based on a lot of different factors. Some of it is pure love of the game, and some people will say, I don't care, I would go back today. Um, other people who may be in a class of people that are more likely to get severely ill from COVID-19 will say, you know what, I'll just watch from home. So uh, we are looking at uh, a few situations. Now, here are your poll results. I have good news for everybody. Nobody said, I'm never going to a live event again. So there is hope for the future of sport and live sport and enjoying it. But we do have a very interesting distribution of 42% for one to three months and 42% for three to six months. Six to 12 months has 17%. So I think everybody is agreeing that we do have a very fascinating amount of people saying, well, we're going to think about this. And I think this is actually very insightful based on how everybody clicked. We know COVID-19 can, people can be asymptomatic. Absolutely fine. They're just carriers. And that's for a lot of young people. Not that there aren't young people who have gotten severely sick from it. But by and large, a lot of people are asymptomatic or just have severe flu-like symptoms. But we also know that the two-week quarantine or self-isolation period is in place because that's usually how long it takes to pass through the system. So nobody said, I'm going immediately. Um, but we do have a lot of people saying, uh, one to three months. I'm going to let this thing pass. The government may say it's fine. The league may be open, but I'm going to play it a little cautious. It's very positive for the future of professional sports to show that people will still show up. Now, again, it really depends on the nature of your business and sport, how much of your business, because not everything in professional sports is the top grade. There are people who go to a lot of minor league sports that rely more on those gate sales. Now, in Australia, it was actually a culture shock for me when I got here, when I saw the massive, massive level of people participating in local sport and showing up to play on lower tiers than the top, much more stratified. I'm accustomed to a US culture where when you stop playing a sport, it's because you stop trying to make it to the next level to reach the professionals. Very, very unique uh, in what we're looking at here. Um, I think that that's one of the things people have to ask when we're looking at the professional, uh, the future of professional sports, how much are we really, really considering the future of sustainability? Now, again, fringe sports and fringe divisions of sports um, will always be something, but they will take a back seat for a while to the cash cow and the bread and butter of our major league top sports across the world. And that's just how it is. Um, we see other leagues trying to do things that are a bit more uh, novel, let's just say. Um, did anybody tune in? Actually, let me let me ask the question uh, facetiously. We'll give you the next poll, actually. The NBA, for example, has had NBA stars playing video games with basketball against other people, and people were watching them play basketball. On the other hand, um, different racing competitions such as NASCAR and Formula One and 
and whatnot, have been showing their racers, still competing, but in simulators. So I guess I would ask, is there a difference in your mind between watching a Formula One driver in a digital simulation versus a football player or a cricket player playing a football or cricket video game of their own sport? I'm going to try to just be a little bit quiet, but I don't want dead air because I, I don't want to influence your answer. So what I mean by this is, is there a difference in what you perceive as um, any meaningful difference between a professional race car driver racing in a simulation against other race car drivers, as opposed to a footballer or a cricketer playing uh, FIFA or um, fill in the blank professional sport that they compete in? Is there a big difference between that? Oh, big answer is yes. Um, if anybody wants to chat and write in as to why they think that is, I'd be fascinated to know because I happen to share your opinion. But if anybody wants to uh, raise their hand, so to speak, uh, and have a word, I'm all ears. Um, we can do that at the very end of this because my feeling at this point is it's quite different, isn't it? Racing, the motions are much more limited. You can have all of the controls. Now, you don't have the velocity. You don't have the physical exertion. Now, I probably should have this as a follow-up question. How many people have actually been in a race car and raced it at 180 plus miles an hour? Um, I've, been, <laughs> I've been a passenger in one of those, and I've actually driven one at around 150 miles an hour. It's tiring. It's intense. It is brutal, and in no way am I ever going to take away anything from a NASCAR, Formula One, or any race car driver. But from everybody's minus uh, a few people, I think it was 82% said uh, there is an absolute difference. Um, there's, a, there's a much smaller difference. We're talking about the nature of sports. People tell me, and we're shifting topics now to that eSports VR realm now, that eSports aren't real sports. I say, why? why? Why is it not a real sport? And people say, well, look at soccer and cricket and baseball and football and look at all and ice hockey and field hockey. Those are real sports. Look at them. These are a bunch of people sitting on the couch with a controller just hit, hitting buttons. So I actually looked up the definition of sport. And in the definition of sport, the basic concept was that it is a competition that requires practiced skills of a physical nature, having to do with dexterity, strength, uh, calisthenics, um, you know, cardiovascular abilities, and things of that nature. It never actually said that sport must have actions that are macro, as opposed to micro. Um, clearly, dexterity is there for esports, but let's go to the next question. Does the sport in question six, the, so that previous one, um, meaning the racing, uh, feel more legitimate than other esports? So does it feel more legitimate to have simulated driving as opposed to, let's just say, uh, some of the most popular esports that are out there right now, League of Legends, for example? Um, and if it does feel more legitimate, let's think about that and then let's talk about that at the end. Why does racing in a simulation against other racers feel more legitimate to some than others in playing uh, League of Legends and other esports. I love Mario Kart. I compete really hard in Mario Kart. I'm not a pro gamer, but I, I love that game till the day I die. So does the sport racing in simulation feel more legitimate than other esports? The answer is yes to 71% of the people. It does feel more legitimate. And we're gonna, again, I want people to take a few notes because we're gonna have some conversations about this later as to why it feels more legitimate. Um, I know I'm rapid firing a lot of these polls right now, but the question now is, what would you rather watch in an eSport? Would you rather watch a sport that you would watch people physically running around on, but in digital format? Or would you rather watch something totally new? 
would you rather watch and here's the, the here's the the asterisk i want people to focus on the wording of the first two would you rather watch regular sports played as a video game like fifa by famous professional athletes or regular sports again fifa uh, soccer and whatnot played by professional video gamers so instead of having your professional physical athletes that we all know uh, from watching uh, professional sports would you rather watch the pro athletes or would you rather watch a professional video gamer of that sport or maybe you prefer league of legends again something like that something new that's the question if you were to watch what would you watch and i'm going to give you a quite a an interesting uh, way to look at this after I get these answers. So what's more interesting? Watching FIFA played by actual FIFA players? FIFA played by professional athletes? I'm sorry, professional gamers? Or something totally new? And now I have to be honest, this is a bit surprising to me. 50% of you said a totally new, different eSport game. 30% of you said you would want to see a traditional sport played by a professional video gamer. And 20% said a regular sport played by professional athletes of that sport, physical athletes. Now, this is quite interesting because, again, we're talking about in business a lot, are things in alignment and are things out of alignment? Because we're getting two mixed messages here. People here, and in a very positive way, are saying they would like to watch a totally new sport in esports. Yet so many people at the same time will say, we don't feel that esports are real sports. Why would I want to watch somebody playing a video game if I could play the video game myself? It's a good question. Well, I know when I was a kid, I always wished that there was an opportunity that I could play professional video games. Uh, maybe I'm a kid at heart sometimes, but not, you know, I don't think uh, having a little stubble and maybe a beard eventually is uh, enough to really maintain being a kid. Um, <laughs> so, but really, what is it? Now, let's go back to that first thing from the 1700s. Now, the earliest mention of the sport, of, one of the earliest mentions of the sport of football, any football, we don't know what it looked like, is from Shakespeare's King Lear. So history, poetry, everything is coming together. In King Lear, you have one of the aristocracy making fun of one of the servants and calls him essentially a simple footballer, meaning he's a poor guy. He can't afford to play sports, real sports, on a horseback. He has to run on foot. He has to exert himself. Um, now, remember, these sports that we have grown up with and we inherited from this long tradition of sport, going all the way back to Calcio Storico, uh, Fiorentina, which is still around today. Uh, it's an uh, Italian football code, which is essentially MMA with a ball, have morphed from participation as a form of entertainment to watching and viewing as a form of entertainment. So why would you want to watch somebody playing a, a video game professionally when you can do it yourself? And it's the same reason that you'd want to watch a professional cricketer. You like the game of cricket, or, or rugby league, rugby union, American football, but you want to watch the best. You want to be entertained watching the best. You can participate on the side for fun. And again, I made that uh, distinction that I see more participation here in Australia than I ever did uh, per capita in the US where people still play even tackle sports till they're 40, sometimes 50 years old. But we do want to see the best of the best. Now, there's a very interesting concept that is going on right now as we speak. It's a hybrid between esports and physical sports. Now, I call them PE sports. I like it, the name because it means physical esports, and I like calling it PE sports, and I've called it that since I, you know, it just dawned on me that this is a good name because people know what PE, PE is in school, physical education. Um, it has a nice ring. There are actually arenas that have been set up not just for people to watch gamers holding a controller. There are places where people can go, put on a VR goggle, put on a suit, hold a simulated rifle, for example, and play an eight-on-eight -eight competition. Almost as identical nearly to what you would be doing in a traditional eSport for PC gaming. But instead of using the mouse and keyboard or a controller, you're, excuse me, you're physically there and you have people running around. Now, 
if this is something new to you, well, it's fairly new to me as well, it's fair, because it's fairly new to the world. Because the efficacy and the financial model that it's based on is quite expensive for people to participate, for most people to participate. Uh, we're looking at maybe $80 for about 40 minutes or so. Um, but that's an exciting proposition. Most people remember click to say, I wanna watch people play a new type of game. But I would challenge, say, most people didn't think about this. Well, can I watch somebody playing a virtual simulation game where I can see them running around this warehouse physically, but also on the screen, see what they're seeing and be entertained by these zombie apocalypse and potentially um, uh, futuristic aliens or um, for those familiar with Halo or Halo-like scenarios where you're playing team competition. Now, this is a potential future of sport. Um, we don't know. We know what's going on right now. We know people enjoy participating in it. Um, we know a few things about it, but one thing we absolutely know is that we don't know what people will gravitate towards. Um, I'd like to bring up the fact that the NRL, which uh, I had brought up earlier, this is the sport of rugby league, just an hour ago or so, announced that it would be restarting its competition. Now, this is a tackle football code um, that has 13 players on each side on the field, that has uh, substitutions, that has big guys hitting each other pretty hard. Now, with esports and virtual reality and all these other sports that people tune into, what are we looking at now? If real sports come back, when I say real sports, I'm not being pejorative because I'm the first person to stand up for esports, but traditional sports, if they come back sooner, does that mean the window has closed more quickly for that really special opportunity to get into the marketplace? Um, obviously, Sumo has had a break and most people are not tuning into Sumo um, when it's on unless you're in Japan. But at the same time, really, where are we going? Um, with this model? Are we going to be doubling down? Are we going to bring all the professional physical macro motion uh, athletes back in and are we going to have no audience? Or are we going to be shifting to this more digital platform? Uh, you know, we can ask questions all day long and we can really think about um, what the answer might look like. I'll give a pred prediction. I think esports are going to continue to grow. I think that our traditional sports are going to have to innovate and think of new ways to uh, market, to stay relevant, to keep people engaged. I think, and I'm not going to go into this very much because it's a, another wormhole uh, and rabbit, actually a rabbit hole, pardon me, um, that I don't think is really something for right now. But gambling has changed the way we look at sports. Most people, uh, I, I don't gamble on sports personally, but what I'm looking at is a change in culture between generations where most people are looking differently at competition. I look at, at sports as I wanna see teams playing teams, I wanna see uh, individual players doing great things, usually the superstars, and maybe that's overly simplistic and older generation of me. A lot of people now are looking for specific people to do specific actions because by default, the nature of gambling uh, for better or for worse, has promoted, you know, the first person to hit a six, the first person to score a try, the first, the first, the first, and that has changed. So people are less so, everybody has a team they support now still, but we also have a new component. People are watching more games, but they're not paying attention to each individual game necessarily as strongly, some might argue, because there are other factors that are engaging people into getting involved. Again, you may not also gamble on sports, but when you, you know, like myself, watch the game, they'll talk about the odds of the game, at least here in Australia. America has been late to adopt uh, a lot of these uh, gambling methodologies, but um, it has changed things. The future of sport may be more narrow casted. It is problematic because when you narrow cast, unless you have a truly exceptional product that goes beyond what the average product does, you have a greater chance of failure. Um, so 
the big question is, when are we getting back in the stands? We said that most people said one to three or three to six months. Um, but let's ask ourselves this question in this poll. How much does the in-person game day experience contribute to your enjoyment of the game? Does it mean a lot to you? Do you mind watching on TV an empty stadium with nobody cheering? Or is it, it's no big deal to you? I mean, a lot of people have made comments, positive and negative, saying, you know, about the games continuing without having anybody in the stands. Some people started texting each other. Some people actually have the phone on speaker so they can talk with people. There, people have done a lot of things, but does it mean a lot to you to have people physically there? Whether you're physically in the stands or whether you're watching on TV? So it's a good question. Does it change the way you enjoy it? More or less? Um, because that is going to control how we actually proceed in the future with sport and professional sport in particular. We all know that lower divisions get fewer fans, and that's part of it. Is in some ways we're watching professional sport in the way that we remember competing ourselves as kids with nobody in the audience. Now, that's not the same for every athlete. I read Johnny Wilkinson's uh, biography, and he's a rugby union player, and he talks about a time that he missed a field goal playing rugby union as a kid, and maybe there was one person there, but he went home essentially and cried, and he never forgot it, and he never stopped kicking and practicing because of that. Um, so sometimes nobody there or next to nobody there still means a lot to you, especially if you're a player. You make that mistake, but here are your answers. 10% of you said it doesn't matter to you at all. You just want to watch the game. 20% said a little, so that's 30%. You know, I can take it or leave it. That's 10%, but 60% of you, 60% said it substantially changes your enjoyment of professional sport when there are people in the crowd or not. So when you show up to a game and there's hardly a crowd, you're enjoying it less than when there's a good crowd. When you watch it on TV and you see a, an empty crowd, you say to yourself, huh, I wonder why no one's there. It must not be so great. Or at least you're saying to yourself, this is less exciting. Nobody said that it's worthless to you. And that's also a very interesting fact as well because there's nobody here that's prioritizing the crowd over the reason we went there. Um, now, did anybody actually watch any sports with no audience? Did you think it was just as good? I know we had that it substantially impacts your enjoyment. But was it just as good? Did it lack the intensity of the crowd, but it was good enough for you to be happy? or it really lacked an integral uh, part of the sport and it was boring. It's actually quite interesting because it is. this is a different question than the last one because we were asking about your enjoyment of it. An experience, uh, you know, the broadcast experience in isolation while you're watching on TV, only TV, was it just as good? You still had the same athletes playing just as hard or did that not do it? Was there still a lack of intensity despite the fact that those same great athletes were there? It's actually quite interesting. Is there a difference? And the answer is quite obvious. Lacked intensity, but it was good enough. And other people said lacked an integral part of the sport and was boring. 33% of you. That's much more than I expected. Actually, much, much more. Um, I guess you'd call her my grandmother-in-law was a two-time Olympic gold medalist in the 100 and 200 meter uh, race in the dash in 1952. And she tuned in for Australian rules football and she talked about that. She said, well, we're missing something. Something's different. We can't, we can't do anything different at the moment. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? We love it, we've acknowledged it, but we can't right now. So I think I've given some pretty massive things to think about right now. The only thing that I would say right now so we can get into uh, your questions, because that's actually what gets me here right now and what makes me excited, is what does coming back look like? 
how do we avoid that full stop stop and i want you guys to think about that because one thing is for sure after there's a lockout whether it's a player salary uh dispute or anything it takes a lot to return so i'd like to open the floor and we can have a chat now and uh, answer some of your questions but i'd like to for you to keep that in mind how do we avoid this delay in coming back? 